you're sitting here, you know that you're about to hear some presentations about research that's being done in the fisheries program by two graduate students, Matt Callahan and Valentina Melica. And what you might not know is that they've also been part of a course that I teach called Communicating Science. Um, and this is a class uh, where they have the chance throughout the semester to practice their science communication skills. So today is really the culmination of all of that practice in translating their research for the public. So you might ask, why do we have a class like this in, in fisheries? Um, well, we spend a lot of time as scientists learning how to do science and not as much time learning how to share what we do with a broader audience. And so this is a course that I have taught since 2013, every other year. Um, this is our fourth year, and there have been 33 students from six locations. And uh, they've presented to a total of about 400 audience members all across the state. So this has been a really nice opportunity for us to share some of the work that we're doing. In the years that it takes to get a master's or a PhD, so much of that time is really focused on learning methods, um, analyses, a lot of jargon and really learning the language of science. That's a hard thing to learn. And the paradox is that once you learn it, it's hard to actually unlearn it too. It's hard to remember what it was like before you really knew all of that jargon. And so um, we have this course as an opportunity for students to practice these skills before they go out into the, to the workplace where often they are um, translating research to a public audience and also in fisheries, helping to translate science in a way that it can be used for resource management, which is so critically important. So for good resource management decisions, we need to have good science, and that has to be well communicated. So this afternoon, you'll hear from uh, two students about their research on fish and whales and how they survive in a changing ocean. And uh, Valentina and Matt are at different stages of their degree programs and their research projects. So you'll also kind of get a window into what that research process looks like before the project is done. Um, scientists, I think, would argue that our work is never done, and uh, the ability to ask new questions and continually learn is one of the things that motivates us to do what we do. So um, today we'll have a talk from Matt, then Valentina, and then I'll give an overview of some of the principles of science communication that we've learned through the semester. And we'll hold questions to the end. Um, the three of us will sit up here, and then we can have some Q&A and discussion with the audience. So before we start, uh, we wanted to learn a little bit more about who's here today. I know some of you. Um, so how many folks here are former scientists, current scientists? Anyone? OK. A lot of you. So you're definitely a scientifically literate audience. Um, and then how about folks who are more on the management or policy side? OK. And <laughs> Doug, you count. Um, and then how many people like to hunt fish or harvest? Yeah, a lot of us, of course. And um, in terms of you know, how long folks have been in Alaska, anyone more of a newcomer ha has been here less than five years? OK. And then 10 years or more? All right, and I, I fall right in between, actually. I've been here between eight and nine years. Um, so we have a, a diverse audience here, and we're excited to hear your thoughts at the end of the presentations. So I'm going to queue up Matt's presentation here and then introduce him to you. Okay, so Matt Callahan grew up exploring Juno's wild places, and he knew from a pretty early age that he wanted to study these natural systems. So he earned a bachelor's in ecological and organismal biology from the University of Montana in 2009. And after graduating, Matt came back to Juno and worked at the University of Alaska Southeast, where he got to study this really cool range of things from climate effects on tree growth to glacier estuary dynamics and even mountain goat behavior. But then he went back into fisheries working for NOAA's Ock Bay Labs, and he focused on Arctic forage fish and invertebrates. In 2017, Matt started the master's program in fisheries, and he works with me there. Um, Matt's research investigates the environmental factors that affect survival of young uh, sable fish, affectionately known as black cod to many of us. And they are one of the most commercially valuable species in the Gulf of Alaska. So today, Matt's going to tell us about how sable fish are, in fact, the honey badgers of the sea. 
Thanks, Ann. Uh, can everyone hear me? Cool, yeah, well, <clears throat> my title will make more sense if you've seen a certain YouTube documentary about honey badgers. Uh, if not, it's worth your three minutes. But basically, the honey badger runs around the African savanna eating whatever it can. Uh, and sable fish do pretty much the same thing, swimming around in waters near you. Like this one right here. The sable fish is on the bottom, and the ling cod on the top of the picture came out of that sable fish's stomach. Now that would be like you or me eating a Thanksgiving turkey, and then still having room for mashed potatoes and a pumpkin pie. <clears throat> and what did the fish do after this meal? Kept eating. <clears throat> Bit onto our squid bait and got caught. <clears throat> so sable fish are really neat fish. As Anne said, come on in. Um, <clears throat> As Anne said, they're also known as black cod or ishkeen in Clinket. Uh, and adults live very deep, so 1,000 or 2,000 feet of water. Um, but they aren't sensitive to the pressure changes that will kill a rockfish if you bring it up from that depth. Um, so you can bring a sablefish up from 2,000 feet, and it'll be feisty as ever. And uh, let it go, it'll swim right back down. <clears throat> um, Sablefish live from Baja, California, uh, up to the Aleutian Islands and Bering Sea, and they do long migrations uh, throughout this range, thousands of miles. <clears throat> and they live about as long as humans do, uh, up to 100 years old. Uh, my favorite fact about sablefish, though, is that they're delicious. <clears throat> and because of that, they support a lucrative commercial fishery. But uh, there has been a slow decline in the stock, and that's been linked to low survival of juveniles to adulthood. And so I'm studying some of the things that might make for good or poor conditions for juvenile sablefish. So I'm gonna take you through the early life history of a sablefish. Um, the adults spawn in winter offshore, and the juveniles are, they inhabit surface waters, and this is where they really begin their honey badger-like ways. They eat all kinds of plankton and other small fish, and they consume so much that it fuels some of the fastest growth rates recorded in any fish. By the end of their first summer, currents transport them to near shore areas where they settle uh, into coastal bays and estuaries, and that's where they spend their first winter and their second summer before moving into their adult habitat uh, where they're caught in the commercial fishery beginning around age two. <clears throat> My research focuses on this near shore phase around their first winter. And that's because winter uh, is a period that tends to have poor foraging where young fish are likely to die. <clears throat> the energy that sable fish need to survive or any fish, comes from its prey. And so I'm studying the quality of sablefish prey. And my specific question is how that prey quality changes over time. So I'm collecting sablefish from St. John Baptist Bay, which is a known sablefish nursery area about an hour boat ride north of Sitka, Alaska. Um, my study design is to catch them after their first summer in the fall, right before they're gonna go into winter. Winter happens, come back and catch them again in the spring, <clears throat> get them in a post-winter state, and then sample again during their second summer. And I'll do this for two years. And right now, I'm, um, this summer will be the, the last summer field trip of the research. So you can see a small sable fish that uh, has lived through one summer, that's a small one, and then a larger one is what it looks like after another year of growth. So that's kind of the size range that I'm looking at. Uh, we catch them with hook and lines, which is really fun because they fight a lot as you expect from a honey badger-like creature. <clears throat> um, I do gastric lavage for the, uh, getting their stomach contents. and pry their uh, esophagus open with forceps and squirt water into their stomachs to flush out the contents. <clears throat> and that 
uh, that allows us to figure out what they're eating without killing them. And then I bring the contents back to the lab and determine the quality of the prey, kind of the same way you would with a bag of chocolate chips. <laughs> so I originally had this as uh, calories per gram, but I decided to do a more relative scale of, of great, that's your Talenti gelato ice cream, to terrible, which is your celery. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> we'll talk about the worst things that they eat first. Um, these are tinafores, which is a type of jelly. Um, these are really low calorie. Sablefish don't care. Gobble them up just the same. So that's the, the bottom of their, their diets. <clears throat> um, next, they eat a lot of zooplankton. These are <coughs> mycid shrimp, and they're common in near shore areas, and they're commonly found in the fall diets. Uh, the most common thing we found by number were these hyperid amphipods, as these are kind of like related to the sand fleas that you pull up in your crab pots. Um, <clears throat> and so these are the most numerous prey. And they're better than jellyfish, but uh, still not very good prey. Uh, during the summer, they ate a fair amount of polychaete worms, which are bottom-dwelling worms. And these are calorie-rich. And some of the stomachs are just chucked full of these worms. They're pretty nasty. <clears throat> um, and so these were the surprise winner for our, uh, our prey quality. Uh, so don't underestimate the production on the bottom. They caught, we caught some, uh, some fish that were rare in the diets, but they're large. And so for the fish that ate them, they got a lot of calories from the fish, even though the um, quality per, per gram wasn't that good. They were about on par with the zooplankton, except they were quite a bit bigger. Uh, now for the main event, the Pacific herring. Up to 80% of the stomach contents weight of all of the fish in some seasons was made up of herring. And these are good quality prey. Um, and I analyzed the quality of the herring in each season, and it came out about the same. And so because of that, the overall seasonal differences were minimal in prey quality. And the last fish I'm going to talk about is the, the shiner perch. And these are the largest things that they ate. Uh, these are so big that you couldn't flush them out of the stomach because they're too tall. And so you had to kind of grab them with forceps and yank them out. <clears throat> OK, two, and they're about on par with the, with the herring in quality. To recap, um, uh, this, is, this hasn't been done before. No one has sampled sablefish diets around winter. Um, they eat a diverse amount of prey. And herring were the most important prey in all seasons. And uh, the overall prey quality did not differ between seasons. So what does this mean for juvenile sablefish? Um, this diet diversity might help them not starve during their first winter. Remember that the prey has the energy that the sablefish need to survive. And in order to survive winter, fish need to grow and need to get fat. So if you grow large, then there are fewer things that can eat you, and you can eat more high-energy prey. And if you get fat, then if there's no food for a while, you can use those fat stores to survive. So if you've got a, a large fish and a small fish, large one is more likely to survive winter than the small one. Similarly, if you have two fish that sit the same length, one has a lot of fat, one does not, then the fat one's more likely to survive. <clears throat> and in addition to winter, this ability to eat a lot of different things might help sablefish thrive in a changing ocean. So water temperatures are warming, and with that comes potential, potentially different prey. Uh, big schools of small squid are a relatively new phenomenon around Sitka, and sablefish are able to capitalize on these. So their ability to eat big things, to eat small things, to eat good things, to eat bad things, to take what they want, really helps the sablefish thrive in a changing ocean. All right, with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped with this project. And I'll thank you for listening. And please save questions for a panel afterwards.
Matt will stick around afterwards to do a lavaging demo if anyone is too full after lunch. <laughs> so our next speaker, let me get her talk queued up. Our next speaker is Valentina Milica. She is from Italy and started her PhD in the fisheries program at UAF with a Fulbright scholarship. Her backgrounds in ecology and physiology of marine organisms, especially marine mammals, as you'll hear in her talk. And over the past decade, she spent time in Italy and the US finishing her master's degree, interning and working. Valentina's research at UAF focuses on large whale endocrinology and her advisor is Dr. Shannon Atkinson. Um, they study reproductive and stress-related hormones in blue and gray whales from the North Pacific Ocean and how those hormones change in a changing environment. So today, the title of her talk is A Whale's Guide to Stress Management. Okay, thank you, Anne, and thank you all for being here. So I'm actually gonna put you all on the spot and ask you a question. First thing, who feels stress or has experienced stress? Great, I knew that was uh, like easy, a very easy question. Yeah, we've, we've all been there. We definitely can relate to this figure. We've been feeling this emotion and feelings and um, dealing with different issues. And there's many things that stress us out. It can be work, it can be life, unexpected event. Um, but you know, stress is not all that bad. We kind of need stress. Stress is what keep our body responsive, aware, keep our energy going. And that's the same for animal. They kind of need stress to be very close, fast in reaction. And sometimes that can make the difference between life or death. The problem arises when that stress is 24-7, 365 days a year. So it's, it becomes chronic and most of the time can be the same thing over and over and over that is stressing the animals out. Interestingly enough, the ocean is a very stressful place. There's a lot of noise in the ocean, there's a lot of fish, and there's also a lot of plastics. There's a lot of fishing gears that gets in the way, um, and all those disturbances can definitely be um, stressful to all the animals that, that inhabit it. But what is stress, and how do we, what happens to our body when we are stressful? Well, we all have heard about hormones, right? Hormones are really tiny molecules that, that works as messengers between different parts of our bodies and spark different reactions. The, the main one to blame for, is, for stress is cortisol, which is kind of like the good guy and also the villain in the story. Cortisol travels to bloodstream and its whole goal, the life goal of cortisol, is to make energy somehow. So all he wants to do is find somewhere in our body where there's a lot of energy and start burning that. That place is fat. Adipose tissue is just another way to store um, energy. And who has a lot of fat? Whales. Whales definitely have a lot of fat. And it's a very important part of their body. Blubber is used for thermal regulation. That's a way the whales don't get too cold or too hot. As I said, it's a food reserves and somehow um, it's what they access when they cannot access food during the migration. Um, it's what they use for weaning their babies, so it's a way actually to maintain them. Um, and likely for me, hormones love fat. Um, but what happens if we start burning that fat, if hormones start burning that fat too fast? Then we will have skinny whales. We will also have whales that are not really able to reproduce anymore and they're just very unhealthy. Um, but enough about stress and let's introduce the real stars of this talks, which are the whales. Which ones? Well, I work on two species of whales, um, which are very unique. The first one is the gray whales, also known as the devil fish, which is the mammals that perform the longest migration. And on the bottom over here, we have the blue whale, which is the biggest animal that has ever existed. So all these unique animals um, share something in common in our area, and that's their migration route. They both take the Eastern North Pacific Railway. They spend their winter months in the waters of Mexico, and then they migrate during the spring and the summer all the way to, all, the, all along to the US West Coast, Canada, and then the Gulf of Alaska, 
and then in the case of the gray whale, all the way to the Chachki and the Bering Sea. So how do I go from these giants and very elusive animals to the really little tiny molecules that hormones are? Well, likely for me, yes, okay, um, I use blubber biopsy or blubber samples from stranded animals, and I literally squish the hormones out of that. And then I use something that is called enzyme immunoassay, which is a very hard word to measure how much hormones, and in this case, how much cortisol they have in their fat. What my res I can give you an idea of what my results look like. Here we have a little graph. All those dots are single whales. The blue ones are the blue whales, and the green ones are the gray whales. And then on the vertical axis, we have how stressed they are from low to high. And as you can see, most of them are in this area, which is probably like just a normal level of stress. And there's a few of them that definitely stands out. Most of those animals are actually stranded animals that die because they were hit by a boat or they were very, very skinny. So they were experiencing some sort of starvation or nutritional stress. So the next question that comes after is, what is next? What would a whale do when they're stressed? How do they cope with it? I know what I do. I go climbing, I go hiking and camping. I actually just came back from camping because I was stressed for this talk. <laughs> um, but what the whales might do that is still very much unknown, here's a few ideas. They might look for other feeding grounds, so they might um, extend their migration, they, they might look for other spots to feed. They might change their group dynamics. We might have smaller groups or more solitary whales rather than bigger groups. They also might budget their energy and choose survival over reproduction. So we might overall have less and less and less whales in a long term. Or they can also completely change their migration. This is a funny um, comic, but it's pretty true. They might decide not to migrate at all. And they might decide, for example, the gray whale to stay in Mexico and not come up at all. But why is my research important? And I hope to transfer this message. Why do we care about this? Well, especially here, we know that whales can be a very important source for tourism and economy. Um, my research focuses on two whales that are not exactly in our neighborhood, but can be applied also to other species. And here we have humpback whales that sustain our whale watching industry. Blue whales and gray whales sustain whale watching industry in California, for example, in Washington State and Puget Sound, as well as Canada. So they're very important. Also, whale poop is the best fertilizer ever. So we need to have healthy, whales and ha keep having their population growing so we can have more of their poop, more fertilizing, and hopefully more fish. And also, some, of, some species of whales, including the gray whales, they're culturally important and they are an important source of food for native communities along the Arctic as well as the Pacific West Coast. So my research is part of a bigger program, is part of what is called the One Health Approach approach, sorry, <laughs> which is an holistic way of seeing the whole environment. Everything is interconnected and nothing can stand without the other. And the different parts are environmental health, animal health, and human health. And my research just fit as a little piece of a bigger puzzle um, to understand how these old things and how all these components can relate to each other. I went really fast because I was really nervous and my cortisol levels were really high. Anyway, <laughs> with that, <laughs> I hope I transmitted my message and I, you, you learned about my research. Um, I want to thank Anne for being a great mentor, my advisor, my comedian, and all the people that work with me and then provided samples for this. And with that, I thank you all for your patience and your attention. And please, if you need any more information, feel free to email me and I'll you take the stage again. Okay. Great. All right, so you've gotten a little window into the research that Valentina and Matt have been doing for a couple of years and will continue to do. And now I wanted to 
um, kind of uh, draw back the curtain a little bit for you to see what our process of learning about science communication has been through the semester and the different types of tools that the students have been building. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of, of, of my story and how I came to see the importance of science communication. Um, I grew up in Rhode Island in a teeny tiny state with a lot of people and I fished with my family as a kid, spent a lot, a lot of time at the beach and I loved all things fish and ocean life, but I really didn't know what a fishery was until college. So that's when I read this book. Has anyone read Cod? So the title of the book is Cod, the Biography of the Fish that Changed the World. And for me, it, it really changed my worldview because it opened up um, this history and importance of fisheries in New England and how that shaped the place that I grew up. And through a, a series of fortuitous events, I got a job as a fishery analyst at the New England Fishery Management Council. And that's one of the councils that manages federal fisheries around the US. So I really got to experience what it was like to um, be in those meetings where content sometimes contentious decisions were being made. And some of the bright spots I saw were when scientists and fishermen and managers could get together and effectively communicate their goals with each other and their knowledge. And sometimes that happened kind of outside the highly charged political environment of those meetings. I decided to in increase my toolbox as an ecologist. And so I went to the University of Washington and, and got a degree in fisheries. And then I started my job here in 2012. Um, and my research group, my students and I, work on questions ranging from the human dimensions to the ecology of coastal fisheries. So we draw from lots of different disciplines. We work with lots of different people. And so communication is an important skill set. So there are scientists here today besides us up here. And so this little comic might be familiar to you. Um, so it says, cards for scientists from their non-scientist relations. And so one of them says, we still don't understand your work at all, but we are very proud. <laughs> yeah, so we can relate to this. And so one of the things that we try to do in this class is think about ways that we can connect informally and formally about what we do and be able to better share our work. So I'm going to walk through some of the principles of science communication that we talk about in the class. Um, and one of them is show, don't tell. So someone who hasn't already seen this slide before, uh, tell me what you think the message is that I am trying to convey in these pictures. I see that you're making gestures. Do you want to say it out loud? <laughs> OK. Don't worry. If you talk now, you're not going to get picked up for the recording. Only if you're speaking into the microphone. Jane. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So, so the message here is that there used to be a lot more big fish than there are now. And I used to show this um, set of pictures a lot when I talked about my research on link cod because they used to be just monster size um, along the whole West Coast and they've, they've kind of shrunk over time. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, sometimes we have a good big fish story. Everybody loves a, a big fish story. It kind of tells itself. Um, but a lot of times it's hard to find the story in our research, especially when it's not done and it's almost never done. And so we use tools like this inverted pyramid of journalism. Journalists tend to put the most newsworthy information up front, who, what, when, where, why. And then they include important supporting details. And then if the reader's still hanging in there, and reading the article, they may get the broader background and context. Scientists will often put a lot more context up front and then not do justice to their results or interpretation of those results. So we try and practice flipping the order in which we tell our story. So I'm going to use um, an example here from Doug Duncan, who's in the audience. Um, Doug took the class a couple years ago, and he came up with a really clever analogy for his research. Um, he earned his master's in fisheries, and he, he now works at the NOAA regional office. So Doug's research is focusing on the effects of hatchery releases on the ecology of our estuaries here in Juneau. So the hatchery releases millions of fish into the environment. How are predators responding? And so Doug's original research question is, what are the functional and numerical responses of predators to an ecological subsidy? So this is a very well-framed science question for ecologists, but how do we actually translate this in a way that's more understandable? 
So Doug stopped for a second and he kind of came up with three approaches to translating his research question. So he, he eliminated jargon, that was first. Then he made it relatable using an analogy and then he showed it in pictures. So he asked himself, what does that really mean? And so kind of the, the less jargony way of framing this research question is, do hatchery releases attract more predators? So if you think about these, um, these young salmon that are being released into the environment by the hatcheries, that's a possible prey source that might have not been there otherwise if it wasn't for the hatchery. So in a way, it's kind of like free food. So Doug thought about how do fish or people react to free stuff, which brought this to mind. Do we see a Black Friday style feeding frenzy? And this is a really vivid way of expressing the crux of his research question. We talk a lot about how do we answer the so what question, and this is really how to uh, talk about the importance of our research to different audiences. Why, is it, why does it matter? And um, I'll give an example from some of my own research when I was a postdoc in Washington. I was doing a project on the historical ecology of Puget Sound, and I was trying to reconstruct uh, changes in fish populations over many decades using multiple different knowledge sources. So interviews with fishermen, um, survey data from the State Fish and Wildlife Agency, and try to understand how these populations had changed so that we had a historical baseline. Sometimes I would use that as the context. So talking about why we need to know where we've been to be able to manage sustainable fisheries in the future. But for some audiences, that wasn't very compelling. So sometimes they had to turn to more of a species specific view. In Washington, people get really excited about pink salmon. I know that seems crazy to Junoites. Um, but you know, sometimes I'd talk about, well, how have pink salmon populations changed? Um, that's gonna have an effect on your fishing. Sometimes I had to bring it um, closer to the value of fish as food. So having healthy salmon populations um, for us to, to eat them means that we need to know how they've changed. One time I gave a talk to an audience and somebody said, is this just about fish? And it, it is just, my research was just about fish, so I was a little bit stumped. But I was able to then relate, say, changing salmon populations back to changing orca populations. And um, again, this is a charismatic animal that people really care about in Washington. Um, one of my audiences was not that interested in fish in general, and it wasn't until I said that healthy fish populations mean a healthy Puget Sound that I started seeing heads nodding. And so this was a real lesson to me in different audiences where I presented this work in answering that so what question depends on who your audience is. So in this class, we talk about how do you know your audience, and I asked you a few questions at the beginning to try and get a sense of your background and maybe why you came. Um, luckily, this is not an audience here that fishery scientists have to speak to very often, but a lot of times we prepare our talks for adult audiences. So two years ago when my Fairbanks students um, gave their final presentations at the Museum of the North, they expected an adult audience and this is what they actually got. They had a Cub Scout troop of six and seven year olds <laughs> and uh, they had to throw their script away immediately and find a way to connect with the kids. So one way to connect, um, Randy Olson, who is a, an ecologist turned filmmaker, wrote a book called Don't Be Such a Scientist. And one of the, the sort of messages he sends is, be human, be relatable, take off your scientist hat. So my Fairbanks students, when they were faced with the terror of having a bunch of six-year-olds in the audience, um, they really stepped up to the occasion, and one of them was able to connect just through a few little word changes. So she would sometimes present her data collection as we collected 100 fecal samples from juvenile shorebirds. And then when she was um, in front of that audience of kids, she said, we collected 100 poops from baby shorebirds. And she said it in a really engaging and funny way, and the kids just started laughing. And very soon they started to ask her really insightful questions. So how did you actually do that? Why did you do that? What, what is it that you learned from doing that? I have another example of how to kind of take off our scientist hat and be a little bit more approachable. And this is from Lorna Wilson, a PhD candidate and a fishing game employee here. 
um, she used images in a really effective way instead of graphs to show data. So this was her original slide. This is very typical of what we'd see at a fishery science conference, and this is actually a very beautiful figure. There's a lot of information in it, but maybe not that accessible for a broader audience. And so when she gave her presentation, she used scale images to tell a story. So salmon have scales and as they grow, they lay down rings just like trees. And so you can measure the distance between those rings to, um, to measure their growth over time. So she studied Chinook salmon. There's, this is two different fish. And she was able to trace the periods of growth on both of these scales. So the fish on the left and the fish on the right had pretty similar freshwater growth. And then um, something changed in that first year in the ocean. So the fish on the left was a slow grower. The fish on the right was a fast grower. And then over time, that fast grower maintained that advantage in growth. And after its third year in the ocean, it matured and it came back to the river to spawn. The slow grower stayed one more year in the ocean and so what Lorna found was that these slow growers are older and they're larger when they return to the river to spawn, whereas those fast growers are younger and they're smaller when they come back to the river. So this was a really nice, effective way of actually showing the data, the same information that she had showed in that figure before. So I hope that gave you just a sense of the different types of tools and approaches that we practice, and this is a lifelong practice. Uh, we, we all um, have a lot of growth as scientists in this area, and I think above all, we feel that it's really important to, to share what we do because we're really lucky to be scientists, especially here in Alaska. It's an adventure to go out and learn about these natural places, and so we hope that, um, that you've enjoyed hearing about some of our ways that we're learning about the natural environment. Um, so with that, I would like to to thank you all for your time. And we're gonna come sit up in the front and have an opportunity for questions. And again, if you, if you don't want your question recorded, you can ask us not in the mic, and so you won't, your voice won't show up on the recording at all. So thank you. Testing. So um, the IT folks did say, ideally, if people would ask your questions into the microphone, they would appreciate that. So if you're comfortable doing that, um, here's a microphone that we can pass around to the audience. Yeah, exactly. Howdy, folks. How relevant is your work to the demise of salmon and how do you communicate what you know about it or what you don't know about it and what others might be trying to find out about it because everybody wants to know what's happening with salmon. Mm -hmm. You want to take that? Um, so my work is not specifically related to salmon. Um, Sablefish sometimes eat salmon. Salmon sometimes eat sablefish, but uh, the population trends of salmon are beyond the scope of my data. So as scientists, we have to be careful to not speak outside of our wheelhouses um, while still addressing people's concerns. So uh, we actually get that a lot where people are, are interested in some kind of oceanographic issue that is not what we're studying. Um, and so it's important to be a, a somewhat well-versed scientist, but you also have to um, only answer what you know. I guess, do you want to elaborate further or ask a follow-up question? Yeah, the North Pacific is the common home for all these species. So what's happening to the species in which you are an expert might be also happening to or explain the situation for salmon. So can't you step beyond your silo then to interact with other silos and say there seems to be something in common, uh, something fundamental, maybe the bottom of the food chain going on here? Uh, 
Yeah, someone could. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what's going on with Sablefish. Um, once I once I figure that out, then I'll talk to the salmon people. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think you're asking a really good question. I don't know the answer to this to what's going on with salmon question either, but I think this is sort of bringing up a bigger issue of you know how far should scientists go beyond their comfort zone, and that's something that we talk about a lot in this class. And I think that as you go further on in your career, then you gain more experience, um, you're interacting more with other colleagues in other fields, and I think it becomes easier over time. When you're a grad student, you know, you're, you've got a lot of learning curves that you're facing all the time, and you're really just trying to gain some mastery over your specific area of research. So, um, yeah, so I think that you're right in that the, the, Pacific, the North Pacific is the common ground there, and so all of us studying species within that environment um, do need to make sure that we converse with other scientists and other experts and fishermen and, and read broadly so that we understand the common themes. And shouldn't your conversation always end in, that's an interesting question, did you, <laughs> did you want to fund the study? <laughs> yes, uh, that's exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, we had a very interesting talk from Noah uh, regarding looking at, it happened to be salmon, I'm sorry, but, uh, uh, but it was salmon from the hatcheries. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to find out where they really went and who was eating them. And I guess my question is, is there a negative effect of uh, releasing uh, salmon after incubating them, you know, like Macaulay's hatchery here? Is there a negative effect of that? A negative effect on other... Other fish. Uh, other fish. Yeah, yeah, other fish. That's actually a, a pretty contentious area of, of research and, um, and questions, actually, that are still out there. And, you know, there's definitely a lot of hypotheses and thoughts about how those hatchery fish might be interacting with wild fish. Um, and I think a, a lot of that is still not very well known. Um, there's, there has been research on straying, so those hatchery fish don't make it back to the hatchery, they end up in wild streams. What are the effects on the wild system? So, yeah, there could definitely be negative effects. Yeah, well, that's mm -hmm. okay. Yep. I have a sablefish question. <laughs> Um, so there is a big sablefish uh, recruitment, at least one year class uh, from 2014 that's coming through the population right now. And um, I guess full disclosure, I work with sablefish and do the, the state water assessment for sablefish. And one thing that we've wondered is if as that big year class moves down and enters the population that is accessed by the fishery, if um, because of uh, the big warm water mass that's sitting out in the Gulf of Alaska, if they might be occupying different areas than they would otherwise be occupying because of the warm waters. And I guess um, since you're probably more familiar with the <laughs> literature than me, I'm wondering if you um, kind of have any updates on, on any research that's going on to, to look at that. So I haven't seen any um, peer-reviewed work specifically related to that out of the last couple years. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Um, I will say they're definitely inhabiting areas that people don't expect, like the Bering Sea. Um, the Pollock fleet caught a ton of age two sablefish last year um, in areas where they usually don't. And so that's a, that's a big issue. Um, we. Uh, mostly just catch the, the smaller ones. Um, we don't we didn't see a lot of age or hardly any age twos uh, in our survey um, in the shallow bays. So uh, I wouldn't say that they're staying in shallow areas longer. I guess. Uh, I can say one more thing about uh, sablefish and salmon. Uh, they have a cool um, relationship where the uh, adult salmon will eat uh, young sablefish as they're in that first summer of life. The uh, salmon are one of their main predators. And, um, and then when the salmon smolts, 
come out in the spring, sable fish will eat those. And some of them will actually hang out by hatcheries and eat hatchery releases as well. Um, and then as the salmon come back to spawn um, and their carcasses are washed out of streams, the sable fish in the basil um, big, bite big chunks off of those carcasses and enjoy that subsidy as well. I've actually got a, a whale question. So um, two, two things that kind of occurred to me, uh, and, and one, it kind of seems like I know the answer to, but uh, your samples came from stranded whales. And so um, and I imagine there's probably a really good reason that they can only come from stranded whales as opposed to just going and getting samples from non-stranded whales. They came from both stranded and biopsy whales. Oh. So I had both alive sam um, samples from alive animals and from stranded animals. Um, most of the, let's say the one that were in the really lowest part of the graph, so the less stressed, were mostly alive animals. And then most of the one that were above um, and with high level of stress, there were stranded animals. Yeah, and there seemed to be, uh, the, was it the blue whales that, that seemed to have the higher cortisol? There was a blue, oh man, I didn't see that. <laughs> yes, there was a blue whale that, and she was a stranded animal. She was a very interesting one, and I should have spent more time on it. Um, that whale was very high, very stressed, but she was also pregnant. So I think there was an additional natural stress to that. Can I ask all of you a question? You don't have to answer into the mic. <laughs> what? Why did you come today? How did you find out about this? Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> How about you? How did you hear about it? Uh -huh. I know how you know about it. We'll we'll say that that off the record. How about that? <laughs> Oh, that's a long question. Um, and it's ac it has a f very funny answer. Um, I did work on whales before, and I actually worked with people that are still um, involved in my project, and they're based out of Olympia, Washington. Um, and that's when I start thinking, I don't know why, I start thinking about PhD. And um, I was, I've been always interested in physiology and how body works kind of thing. And that's how I came up with the name of my advisor, Shannon. The funny thing is that she usually, she used to be in Hawaii. So it caught me by surprise when I found out she was in Alaska. And um, I still went with it. <laughs> and then the project just kind of came together as a collaboration with people that I used to work that I used to work for before. Uh, so the question was about the, the gastric lavage, which is the squirting water into the fish's stomach to get their contents out. Um, we release them except for a subset, which we take back to the lab for another component of the project. Um, and they, yeah, they, they've been caught 
uh, years later, and they're uh, they're surviving. I can't imagine they like it, but um, it's <laughs> it's better than just having their stomach cut open, which is how you usually do a gut content study. Um, I have done gastric lavage on all sorts of fish, from uh, tiny salmon the size of my pinky up to lingcod over a meter long. And uh, one thing that we do to make it more gentle is to sedate them. There's, there's a kind of fish sedative that slows down their respiration and kind of keeps them calm. So that's important. Um, but with, with all of those fish, we've, there have been different studies to see how they survive afterwards. And for the most part, it is a non-lethal approach. And so that's nice because we don't have to kill all of the fish that we're trying to study. Right, so that's how we that's how we would know by tagging them, and all of the the sable fish that we study are tagged. And we've caught a fish that we released uh, half an hour later again, and so they're uh, <laughs> they're going back to eating pretty quick. <laughs> they're very hungry. Yeah. I've got a question for for Ann. Um, I'm wondering about this communication and science. Um, I'm wondering if, it, if sometimes um, folks who aren't as steeped in science might be more adept at this. Say, say undergrads might pick on it, pick up on it better than than people who've been practicing for a, a long time. Wow, I feel like we should all answer this question. So I'm going to put everybody on the spot. But I, I think, um, I, I think it's kind of. Uh, a fine line because I, I do think you need to know the science well enough with enough depth to then be able to talk about it. Um, but at the same time, you're right, it can be a handicap to, to be too much in the weeds. So that's why I think it is about, you know, kind of, it, it is actually a, a different kind of training. And there's some people who have taken my class in the past in the audience too, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. But um, since I am, I have a little bit more experience as a scientist than the students here, I'm wondering if you think that doing, having taken this class now, um, you know, is more beneficial than if you, you know, if you, I guess if you had done it down the road or thought about it down the road. I don't know. I think I think you're right. You need to know your science really well. You need to know what you're doing really well. And part of me is like maybe when I was an undergraduate, and granted it was a long time ago, I was really not in that mental state of trying to share um, that much. And I was just trying to cruise through university. Um, so it kind of never really... It's something that I never really thought about in deep until now, pretty much. Yeah, I think it would work uh, either time as long as you, um, like you said, you know your science and then you keep practicing the communication stuff. So if you, learn, if I were to take this class and then just think about science and not communicating for a couple of years, it would take a, take some getting back to, to um, communicate it well and then, um, I think vice versa. If I were to take the class like five years from now, I could still, it would also take as much time as it has now. Um. Yeah, I would say that's that's pretty right. Like it's, um, it, it's the practice part of it is important. So that's one of the reasons why I teach this class because it makes me stay in practice communicating my own research. Um, yeah, so in a couple weeks, I have to give a, a presentation to a bunch of fishermen, and so that's why I came today, just to rem to remind myself kind of how people consume information, and so that, I, I, I mean, I put together a bunch of slides this weekend, and I violated every single rule that Anne talked about. <laughs> you know, all I showed were my complicated graphs and my equations and everything, and that's not how fishermen consume information. I put the summary table as my second to last slide, my results at the end, 
but really they just want to know what the quota is, right? That's all they care about. Um, and so it's going to take some reframing on, <laughs> on my part, but yeah, so lots of practice. All right, last comment or question. Yeah, in regards to um, looking at the hormones in the whales, similar with the tree rings, I'm not sure if you're able to isolate um, periodic of stressful events um, or like with the layers of tissue. Um, not that you've looked at that, but I don't know if that's something that people are doing or... Um. I have looked at that, oh. actually. <laughs> um, and uh, that is a mystery part of the job, let's say. Um, I have some, what is called blubber depth, so it's a sample from a stranded animal that goes all the way from the skin to the end of the blubber, which can be about like, for gray whales is 15, 20 centimeters long, for blue whales can be 30. Um, and yes, you can see difference in how much hormones hormones is in the different layers but we don't know really how long does it take for that blubber to build up so you can measure a stress event um, you can have an idea as I said um, most of the green dots that were gray whales stranded animals I know I wish I had a graph on the back of me but um, they were either hit by a boat, hit by a vessel, or were really skinny when they were found out, and that indicate at least a few weeks or days of stressful event that might have affected them. But it's hard to step to estimate because we don't know how long right. does it take. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to say that uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, and that there are snacks on the <laughs> outside. We're not allowed to eat them in here, but there's, uh, there's some good stuff. The, the coconut clusters were the number one snack from field work. Um, it was our, our favorite out on the boat, um, but there's also veggie tray, some cookies, and some um, chips and hummus and dip. I, I could find one for you, Jane. All right, Th thank you all so much. <laughs>